Hello, Mihil. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks a lot for inviting me. Um, this is this is awesome. You're one of those um, internet friend type of connections, and I really am grateful that you you know looked at my message and responded. Um, and for context, I've been doing a series of interviews um, with people in fields related to computer science or you know different kinds of practitioners of computer scientists, and I've covered people in big tech, I've covered startup founders, I've covered academics and uh, you know people in CS education, but you're the first person who falls into the, the large bucket of open source. Um, and you also happen to be uh, you know one of the key people in uh, an open source project that has become very, very dear to my heart, um, which is Clojure. Um, and so I would love to spend the next you know hour or so chatting about uh, your story and how you ended up becoming a full-time um, open source developer for one side, but also on the other side, geek properly geek out about Clojure because um, I wanted to. I want the spread the message, you know. The, I want to spread the good news. Um, so why don't we start with your story? What was your path into uh, toward programming and becoming a uh, you know a software engineer? Sure, sure. Um, well, as a kid, I already liked computers. So I started with uh, GW Basic <laughs> on a PC that my father owned. And I, uh, by breaking his PC, I learned about a computer, much to my father's annoyance. Uh, you know, go to 10 and uh, print uh, Hello World, <laughs> things like that mm-hmm. on in, in like primary school. Uh, and then later in High school, I kind of lost interest a little bit in in programming. Um, I, I mean, I did sometimes I picked it up, but I wasn't heavily into the things in it. As a teenager, I was more into like going out with my friends and doing like mm-hmm. teenage stuff. Uh, but at the end of high school, I had to decide what I want to do uh, for for studies I I was heading towards uh, university and um, I I decided that at one point I had in my mind that I wanted to study economics or there is uh, like uh, but there is this other direction that is more mathematical so I, I like mathematics but um, I bought some, as a teenager, I also bought some stock stocks of, mm. uh, of an IT company. And uh, this IT company, a Dutch IT company, completely went bankrupt. So I lost, mm. and once I, I worked for this money uh, all summer long, and I lost all of it. And uh, then I decided... You know, this money stuff, this economic stuff is not interesting to me anymore. <laughs> and <laughs> I gave up on money. <laughs> I gave up on this. And then I decided I still like mathematics. I still like uh, programming. And then I decided, okay, let's do computer science. But always during computer science, I wasn't completely satisfied. So I started to study mathematics on the side. Uh, but that was too a little bit too much and then i uh, decided that within my computer science curriculum i could do a lot of other stuff as well so mm. mathematics and philosophy and also uh teaching actually um so yeah it was kind of a the major was let, let's say in computer science and i have a minor in philosophy and uh mm. also uh i have a minor in uh teaching so mm-hmm. um yeah and then towards uh i so the first course at my university in the first year uh, the, the first programming course was in uh, miranda and uh, miranda uh, was or yeah it's not really active anymore but it was like a predecessor to haskell which is a functional programming language but mm-hmm. haskell it i think it was around back then but uh at my university didn't use it. We used Miranda, which was this um, 
It was uh, not open source. It was also not free mm. to use. And it only mm. ran on this Unix systems on our university. So I like the concepts of it, of a functional programming, mm. of making pure functions. Uh, you put data in and there, there is data out and nothing hap magical happens in between. Uh, and then the second course was was in Java, and I, yeah, I immediately lost interest in, in programming again. <laughs> I mean, Miranda you don't was have fun. To be so mean. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it was true. It wasn't. So Miranda was fun uh, in the sense that it was elegant to me and it was easy to reason about. But j to be honest, I'm, uh, Java was, wasn't was inviting me to, to do side mm. projects, let's say, uh, for fun. Um, but Miranda didn't either because I couldn't run it at home and do like practical stuff with it. So there was this schism between like elegant languages and things you can really use to make stuff and, and uh, do useful stuff with. So it, but that, this was in the first year of my uh, computer science degree. And then later on, I learned about Prolog and other stuff. Um, and towards the end, I needed to, to do an internship at a company to get some practical experience. Uh, it was a part of the, the curriculum. And I was also in a band back then. I, I was heavily into making music. And I thought, wouldn't it be fun to combine functional programming and music somehow? Uh, so I Googled and I found like uh, a, a different university uh, from where I was. And there was this department of... Uh, they did research uh, to music cognition, so how the brain works with regards to music. And this department, at least the head of the department, was heavily into Common Lisp. And I sent him an email like, oh, I'm into functional programming and music. Can I uh, do an internship with you? And uh, within five minutes, I got a reply. Yeah, fine. Uh, when can you start? <laughs> <laughs> and so a few months later, I was there and it was like, uh, I was very impressed by Common Lisp. Um, I was, the, the idea that you can represent the code as data structures that exist within the runtime of the language that immediately uh, resonated with me. Um, and I thought I was doing functional programming in Common Lisp. Uh, I was doing it kind of because you, it's more like functional programming in JavaScript where you can pass functions mm. around, but everything is mutable, right? So you can still mm -hmm. mess things up. The language doesn't really force you to, to program in a way that, uh, that we consider maybe functional today, but it, it I mean, you could do, uh, you could do interesting stuff with it. Pretty much all you wanted to do, you could express with common Lisp. Um, and then I graduated. Uh, I looked around like I, to find a job and nobody was talking about common Lisp. <laughs> so this experience <laughs> that I had, it was pretty useless uh, in that regard. So I, ha I had to choose between Java or J2EE or uh, .NET. <laughs> and, <laughs> I didn't. I didn't have a clue what all of that was, <laughs> because yeah, my interest yeah. wasn't wasn't in this, uh, like heavily XML driven uh, programming environments. That I don't know. I, I just wasn't attracted to to that. So I didn't do that as a hobby at university. Let's say. So I had hmm. to choose a job, and I di I didn't have a clue what to choose actually, uh, from from what I. Uh, could find. So I decided to just join a company not based on the tech, but just based on what they were doing. I ended up in a .NET company that, that was doing their software development in .NET. And uh, there I, uh, for, for a while, I dabbled with F-sharp, 
which was a pretty neat uh, like OCaml based language. Still, it still exists, and um, mm-hmm. and it yeah. So that was fun, um, but it's only it was only side projects for me, uh, small side projects, and uh, nobody was really using it in like production or anything. At least mm-hmm. not the people I knew. Uh, but um, and then. Uh, few jobs later i yeah for a while i was at uni- uh, at a u- university of applied science and there i actually w- was a teacher over there a, a lecturer and i actually had to teach java but i didn't know much about the jvm i mean i i knew mm. the java the language i could teach the concepts of like object oriented uh, programming but i didn't know much about the platform itself uh, I knew a little bit about .NET, of course, but um, so then uh, I thought there must be a, a, a more fun language to use on the JVM to to learn more like about the JVM while using this language. Like maybe maybe there's something like F Sharp, but for the JVM, hmm. and that's where I found Closure. Uh, so Closure was actually a lisp for the jvm which uh which i like very much because of my common lisp past my brief common lisp past Mm -hmm. but also closure emphasized functional programming more than any lisp that i knew of because all the data structures are immutable so it forces you really to uh yeah stick to the to the functional paradigm let's say Uh, and you could actually use this for I could see myself using this for work because you can actually leverage the whole JVM ecosystem that everybody, everyone is using in like in the industry. Uh, so I used that to familiarize myself a little bit more with the JVM. Uh, so that's how I ended up with Clojure. And then after, uh, I actually taught Clojure as well to students. I developed the course over there. And then when I left that job, I uh, ended up at a company doing uh, first my first uh, ever commercial closure project uh, with Datomic. It was in 2013, mm-hmm. so that's now 10 years ago or so. And since then, I've pretty much always used closure in my, my daily work. Uh, I still dabble with other languages now and then, uh, but I more or less always return to to closure myself. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's there's so many things that you that you brought up that I want to echo. Um, for one, I think we share a lot of the same interests. I didn't know you were into music, but as you can tell by my background, music has been a core part of my life. And then I also have. Um, pretty extensive uh, philosophy studies too. And I've always been very in awe at the commonalities between philosophy and computer science and the power of code and, and, and uh, these ideas in the abstract. And now I'm getting to think there's, there's, there's some kind of overlap between people who have these interests and closure, which Hickey, I think falls into the same (laughs) sort of category of human. um, And he's the creator of the language. Um, So there's, and I want to just like preface this whole thing by by sharing my emotions when I first discovered Clojure, um, which was a, a, this renaissance of my love for computer science. It, it just like it was too many things at once for me. Like I had I didn't really have a good functional programming background, so my my training was always very OOP. In fact, the very first programming language we learned was Java. And, um, mm-hmm. and for context, you know, like I, my parent, my dad is a computer science too. My mom is too. Um, but mm-hmm. I would remember him sharing his experiences of, you know, similar, um, types of, uh, restrictions into coding, you know, like, uh, software that could only run on certain architectures that were very limited hardware. Um, and yeah. I remember my dad, you know, being incredibly, you know, in awe of Java because it's software that can run anywhere. And the JVM is this mm-hmm. miracle of human, you know, creation. And 
And I wasn't able to really appreciate what that meant at the time of taking my first programming class. But in hindsight, the JVM really is, there's something really cool that happened there and something really cool yeah. that was going on at um, Sun Microsystems at the time um, yeah. that uh, sort of plays with this philosophy too, but it is created in the space of industry really leveraging C-based languages, right? C, C++, yeah. um, C, C Sharp even. And so like if they wanted to have widespread adoption, um, they needed to incorporate these um you know, yep. what ended up becoming definitional OOP practices, right? And yeah. so my w way of thinking about programming, and this was my experience at Google too, is it's still very uh, uh, um, object-oriented, right? Like we map these entities, um, we create, um, you know, fields for them dif with different types and then methods that access and edit those fields. Um, and that is how I thought my brain worked, you know, over time since learning Java, you know, there was C++, uh, God save everybody, and, um, and Python, right? And, and, and even though I can appreciate the value and ergonomics that some of these languages bring, there was a completely yeah. reconfiguration of my approach to, um, to programming then. So before we get into closure itself, um, yeah, I wanted to spend some time chatting with you about migrating from an OOP mindset to a functional mindset. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, so, what, what are your thoughts around that? Well, I, <laughs> I think I might have actually had the reverse problem that the functional mindset was more natural for me, and I've always struggled with bringing myself to. Uh, to do OOP. Um, I mean, I think I get it now, <laughs> but, uh, uh, now I, I, I mean, it's just not, not so natural to my brain to, to, to work in an OO, uh, mindset. I think I, I used OOP in common lisp with the common lisp object system. Um, uh, mm -hmm. I mean that was that was okay, but as soon as you're forced to, to create a new file for every little thing you you come up with, mm. then that that kind of kind of boilerplatey way of working that really puts me off, <laughs> and mm. uh, it 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 isn't necessarily OOP uh, by itself, but um, and then. Uh, I think functional programming is so much um, yeah, there's less stuff, you know, there's only functions and data that run through the functions and th there's less things to understand. Um, when I taught at university, uh, at the University of Applied Science, all my colleagues were uh, raving about all these patterns and these these large mm, books mm -hmm. about, about all these visitor pattern uh, abstract proxy whatever <laughs> patterns yeah, yeah. Um, model view control yeah yeah okay and that that's that's uh, some of that is is really useful but I couldn't like uh, I couldn't uh, how how am I going to say this? Um, yeah, I, I think a lot of things are a lot simpler in in functional programming than uh, what you have to do to accomplish the same kind of things in an OOP language. Uh, that sounds really biased, um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I th I think it's yeah I think that's the case. I I don't know why, but my brain just uh turns off <laughs> when I, when i'm forced to to work in such an environment uh and my mm -hmm. well not completely but uh, you know hopefully you it's um i'm not motivated to 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 work through all of this um uh boilerplate <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah, or or mechanical stuff, right? I, I like to think of it as the difference between 
you know, declarative versus imperative. Functional programming has a bit of a higher level abstraction over the problem space than um, OOP or C-based languages where you're still doing a lot of the allocation of memory yourself, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Or, 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 you know, reasoning around this variable is now going to be the a value of the value of the variable plus one. You're incrementing yeah. a variable. And yeah. so, you, so you get caught up in... Sorry, go for it. Yeah, yeah, indeed, indeed. So Rich Hickey calls this uh, uh, place-oriented programming, where you <laughs> talk about, okay, my data is here, and now I replace this data in this place. Um, and that's what makes things hard to reason about, because you have this object graph, and you, you, mm -hmm. you have this reference to this object graph, but somebody else in also has access to this object graph and decides to change one thing like uh, from from under you. And so that's where things get really hard to reason about. Mm -hmm. uh, well, yeah, I don't know. Um, so I, I mean, uh, imperative programming has benefits. I mean, it, you can th make things much more performant and pretty much all functional programming languages are built using imperative mm -hmm. languages. I mean, that's, that's the natural stack to have because imperative languages are closer to like the hardware, mm -hmm. uh, how, they, how, how the hardware actually works. So it's important to, to understand them. Um, and, but, uh, object oriented programming doesn't necessarily have has to be imperative. I mean, there uh, uh, you can you can program like in I think in Scala you can program in a style that is more or less immutable and still be object oriented. Um, uh, there's that too. Uh, and okay, but to come back to your original question, like. Tra migrating from OOP to to functional programming, uh, it's I what I, from what I've heard, it, it's often like you have to unlearn the place oriented programming. That's that's the thing that that that's different. So instead of like having a variable and mutating it, bashing onto the variable like in place, you would just call a function which returns new data. That's like the basic thing that you have to unlearn, uh, I think, for most people. And but a lot of languages nowadays already steer in that direction. So mm -hmm. JavaScript has this uh, destructuring, which doesn't mutate like your old objects, but create new objects. And in JavaScript, you have map filter on on arrays, which return new arrays. So. I mean, the fu functional programming mindset has entered, I think, the, the other languages more. So that might already help people to migrate to a language like Clojure or Haskell or whatever. Um, yeah, so I don't know what else to mm -hmm. no, say that, about it. That's perfect. I mean, I, I was asking you because... Um, I've had trouble articulating what that experience was like um, and the mm. benefits that come with that. Right? It's, it's very hard for me to quantify or give a, um, but it, I think it's comparable to the effects of when you first learn programming and you sort of see code everywhere and you see you know reality as code. Um, I think there's a, an alternative mode of interpreting that code that happens through functional programming. Um, but, okay, so I, I'm, covering this rough arc of properties of closure that are exciting and interesting. So one of them is that it's functional. So it, it like it, it yeah. will teach you new things no matter what. And it just so happens that if you just look at the outcome of those things, it, your code becomes better. Um, or, you know, by all standards of good code, um, closure kind yeah. of edges you toward uh, good stylistic practices. Um, I, I would say... Uh... Maybe better, like it's su subjective, but uh, I mean, the code becomes easier to reason about, I would say. It's easier to follow mm -hmm. 
where to start and where the data goes next and where the data goes next and then eventually where the problem is that you're looking for that's uh mm -hmm. because in, in and, like yeah go ahead so so i so I, I want to sort of punt that a little bit because I want to get into the scariness of the parentheses in, in a second. Ah, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but before that, so it's functional. It's hosted on the JVM, which is how you got into it. And so yeah. in, in the world of software leverage, I think that there was, you know, uh, different computing architectures were emerging. People were writing software for those uh architectures yeah. java comes along and says like wait a minute we'll consolidate the infrastructure to pipe to the architectures you write code on top of this right yeah. and so there's like yeah. this in between layer that gives you all of a sudden lay leverage over all these computer architectures your software now runs everywhere and yeah. this is a just so it's such a cool thing that happened in the world because the amount of effort that went into the java ecosystem and Java libraries and Java support and, you know, just the garbage collector and, and all this stuff um, is incredibly powerful and gives a developer a ton of leverage. Um, and so I think Clojure being hosted on the JVM gives you leverage, a double set of leverage, you know, like uh, uh, leverage on top of, of the Java ecosystem, right? Um, so yeah. I wanted to hear your thoughts on Java being hosted, not just on the JVM, but also on the the closure compiler, and um, and also on uh, small closure interpreter, right? Like for scripting and stuff. Okay. Uh, and, and we'll yep. get to Babashka and all that stuff later. But like sure. just like a brief introduction. Yep. So what was your question again? Um, uh, how do you think about the the benefits of closure being hosted on the on the JVM? Okay. Yeah. Um... So I think uh, when Rich Hickey initially wrote Clojure, he had two versions, and one was for the JVM and one was for the CLR, the .NET runtime. Mm -hmm. And eventually he gave up porting for, for the CLR and decided that Java is the, the main thing that he wanted to target. And uh, I don't know exactly what made him do that, but maybe one of the things, and I'm just guessing here, is he mentioned in a talk once that uh, although Java is not like a very dynamic language, the the JVM actually is a very dynamic environment where you can uh, yeah load new bytecode and uh, things get dynamically mm. updated. Hot swapping um, and hot swapping and that's all possible on the JVM and it's much harder at least that's what I've understood and I I don't really know uh, mm -hmm. but it's harder on on CLR it's not impossible because there is there is a closure version that runs on the CLR as well but uh, maybe one of the reasons is also that the JVM ecosystem is larger than mm -hmm. the, the .NET ecosystem. It's like very large. Um, there's a lot of developers. There's like decades of work that we can leverage from Clojure being hosted on the JVM. And it's still ongoing, it's still improving. Like if you watch at the, if you take a look at the new features in JV, J, uh, or Java 21 or JVM tw 21, like with the virtual threads stuff, uh, mm -hmm. it's pretty exciting. So there is a ton of research that went into the JVM and still improving as we as we are working on top of this thing. And we can leverage the, the, the whole Java ecosystem. I think that's, yeah, it makes sense to, to sit on top of that ecosystem. Um, probably more than any other ecosystem at this time. Mm -hmm. um, and there is Clojure Script, which targets JavaScript, which is also a giant ecosystem. So that's probably the two most important ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and so I'm, I'm trying to paint a convincing pitch for people who are 
have heard of closure who are uh, so i'm trying to entice create a sense of enticement you know it's a new way of thinking through functional programming it gives you access to everything that you know from java or the jvm or even you know if you want to do front-end development like uh you what an incredible way to turn a headache into something really enjoyable than uh, doing it through closure and something like re a reagent or, or anything like that. Yeah. Get to it, that, get to that too. Um, <laughs> okay, so it's hosted, yeah. but, but it's a lisp. And dun, yeah. dun, dun, that is the, uh, that is unequivocally, I was a part of this myself. I approached lisp with this trepidation, <laughs> this like fear. <laughs> I don't know what it is. It's like this mythical thing um, mm -hmm. what is it about the parentheses that scares people? Well, I think you're again asking <laughs> the wrong person because I, I never had a, a problem with the parents. Uh, the, the main idea behind, uh, writing code like that is that your code is a data structure and, uh, and the benefit of that is you can manipulate those, those data structures. So in a Lisp, you can write macros that receive like an expression. You can easily rewrite this expression into another expression that get, then gets compiled. Um, so the name for the for uh, for this is homo iconic. So mm -hmm. uh, Lisp is a homo iconic language, although there are some discussions about whether it's really or not. But uh, mm. But the idea is that that every the code itself can be represented in data structures that you have access to in in the language itself, um, and I think it's mainly just getting used to this syntax. Uh, mm -hmm. Although initially you might find it ugly or scary, but it's just a matter of probably weeks that that you'll get used to it. Mm. And so if you look at, so only actually the placement of the parentheses is, is different compared to other languages. Right. Because if you write a function, if you call a function foo in JavaScript, you write foo, parent open, and then the argument, comma, argument, comma, argument, parent close. And then in closure, you just push the, the first left parent, you push it before the function name instead of after the function. That's actually the only difference. Uh, so arguably, closure doesn't have more parentheses. They are just in a different position. Mm. And because everything is an expression, uh, you don't need to put semicolons everywhere. Uh, so you tend to, you tend to end up with functions that are, have like a lot of closing parentheses with, uh, without anything in between. So like in JavaScript, you, you would have a lot of white space and semicolons in between that makes it look like it has less parents, but it doesn't actually have less parents. The parent, the parent density is just, uh, uh, uh bigger in, in closure. <laughs> There, there's and not more literally than, no and, yeah. and it literally just adds more lines of code right because a lot of these lines yeah um think of curly brackets you know you, you think of like okay there's a line that just has the closing bracket to something at that level and you're sort of nesting you know um one closing paren per line um yeah and but I, so as somebody who went through this relatively recently, you know, it takes mm -hmm. a bit of a cognitive adjustment to, to yeah. let go of things that your brain is just married to for no reason, um, including commas between arguments. Technically, yeah. you never needed commas. You don't need commas. <laughs> and so then, <laughs> then you get to this, uh, to this nirvana state of, oh my gosh, like look at all the, um, um, uh, leverage I can get, you know, in the sort of like the delivery of an idea to a vision much faster because I'm, I have less cognitive steps to do in the meantime. Um, and to the other thing about parens with tools like, um, uh, you know, the, the VS code extensions, um, yeah. par edit and whatnot, where, um, 
sort of you can very easily visually keep track of the parentheses because they're yeah. you know these editors will color them it with their matching print um and not only that because it's homo iconic um it becomes really easy to configure and come up with these code editing tools that format your code for you incredibly easily um yeah. and it sort of knows your editor knows your code as you're traversing as code not as text um yeah. and, and it navigates the the code as code um and once you unlock that degree of power that becomes really cool um and i don't want to let go of the idea of homo iconicity because that was one of the most powerful ideas i've ever come across right um not just in terms of um it's very cool that software can interpret itself as itself but just in general you know that reality may have some uh, you know pretty remarkable similarities uh, it, to homo iconicity um, that yep. let you do all these cool kinds of leverage thing. Um, okay, so now uh, what, to, to, add, to, to add, add one little thing. I mean, people uh, complain that it's hard to match the parentheses, but that's if I wouldn't have like an editor set up for that, I would have the same problem still today. I never do this mm -hmm. manually. My editor does all of that for me. And also like, uh, yeah, transforming like... Uh, uh, you have these, uh, yeah. You have a tool called Power Edit, and you, so you can uh, transform these expressions via key bindings. And so, if you try to do this by hand, by copy pasting like unbalanced parentheses, that's asking for trouble. That that's not the way most closure people work. Uh, and if I enter like a closure expression in, in the command line as a command line argument, I always get it wrong. So just, just as a, even, so if you're a newcomer to closure and you're, you, you think this is difficult, it's still difficult for me without a proper editor. So <laughs> just mm -hmm. to, uh, um, and the tooling is super robust these days. So there's, there's, um, you know, um, I, I, I'm a big fan of Calva, the VS Code mm -hmm. extension, in terms of just even how it introduces you to the language. Um, but okay, so we have this Lisp that sits on top of the JVM that forces you to be uh, programming the functional style. Um, and it also has one added thing, which is the REPL, right? And interactive programming as a uh, sort of like a new kind of discourse with your computer. Um, yeah. And it, it is a very, it is almost, I don't want to say test-driven development, but it's a, an informal version of test-driven development where you're very quickly getting feedback on your code. Um, yeah. um, do you want to also elaborate on um, how that type of scripting dynamic uh, affects your development style? Yeah, yeah. So the REPL is one of the key features of any Lisp, I would say. Um, including closure and what the rep i think most people might know like it's it's kind of like if you don't know lisp it's kind of comparable to writing sql queries like you select a sql query and then you execute this query against the database the database gets a new state you write another sql query to to query something from the database and then you define another query, you transform some data. And this way of, of iterating, uh, that you do it the same way with any programming closure. So you define one function in a namespace and you evaluate just this one function. And then you write another piece of code which calls this function or calls an HTTP service and then transforms the data using that function you just defined. And it turns out this function is wrong or there is a bug in it. Uh, so what you do is you redefine just this function. Then you call this HTTP service again, try it again, all from the repo. It's very incremental. Uh, and what most people in other languages are doing um, is they, they write code, they compile the code or build the code and then run the entire application uh, or just r run one test if you're doing test-driven development. 
Uh, but in Clojure, we do this while the application is, is running. We don't stop the application, but we just incrementally update our hot, uh, uh, yeah, they call it in JavaScript, I think hot reloading, maybe. That's mm -hmm. the closest equ equivalent. Um, but we don't redefine like the whole namespace. or So the unit of compilation in Clojure is a uh, top level form. Uh, mm -hmm. So we don't redefine like a whole namespace. So you, every, all the state you build up in your application isn't automatically uh, erased when you redefine one function, let's say. Um, and you don't have to do anything to, to make this work. This is built into Clojure itself or any Lisp uh, or most Lisps, I would say. And the way why this works is that every uh, function is contained in a var and a var is is not a variable but it's it's really an object that contains something and because there is this indirection a var indirection uh, you can update the what's inside of this var when you redefine a function the var that uh, is not the var that already existed is not replaced but it's updated so every mm. other function that was looking at that, that var will see the redefinition of that function. Mm. Yeah, that's, so that's the, the, yeah, the, the key point there is that you don't have to reload the state uh, every time, right? And, yeah. you know, as you're, I'm thinking of backend tasks in, in backend tasks, you're sort of more of an, in like a workflow type of mentality where you're like, you're trying to test the system end to end. Um, yeah. But for something like UI development, for web development, I mean, you, every time you reload the page, you're resetting the state and you might find yourself, you know, going over a user, you know, a user journey yourself multiple times just to get to the point where you want to test your code. Um, whereas with something like Clojure, state is persistent and because everything's immutable you can just say okay update this thing t test it out in a sort of sandbox environment even without c connecting it to the entire application see that it does what it's supposed to do and 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 iterate from there um which also makes this a lot more enjoyable because the conversation with the computer is faster you're, you're constantly yeah. in dialogue with your your thinking and so you're able to adjust and redirect and and um and optimize faster. Um, and then there's another final pitch to Clojure that is the promise that the language doesn't change or the APIs are <laughs> sort of forever, <laughs> um, yeah. which is which is an incredible thing to say in a world where, um, for example, front end uh, frameworks evolve at the speed of light. You know, within two years, the entire framework needs to be re reassessed. This is true for the app ecosystems too, Swift, um, uh, Kotlin and Android and whatnot, whereas this philosophy gives you stability. And, you know, it's, yeah. it, in most projects, if you don't see an update to the GitHub in, um, you know, in a year or two, the, you think the project <laughs> is dead. <laughs> but Clojure <laughs> is in a different situation. So how do you, how do you market that? Like, how do you, how do you pitch that to people? Yeah, so that that's uh, one thing that I like a lot about Closure too. So the not only Closure the language emphasizes this backward comp compatibility promise, but also the the whole ecosystem actually tries to work in this mindset. I mean, the language doesn't force you. You can if you're if you're maintaining a Closure library, you can make breaking changes, of course, but it's just ingrained into the culture that you're, you, you're not doing that or try to avoid it. Um, and because closure uh, is a very flexible language, it's pretty easy to, to maintain backward compatibility. So most functions receive uh, not concrete like classes, with named classes, but uh, it's just data flowing through the functions. So uh, data is like maps and uh, lists of things. Um, mm -hmm. 
and it uh, you can always add an extra key to to a map uh, mm. or uh, or change like add an extra argument to your function, which receives a map of options and then um, uh, accommodate like changes without breaking the existing uh, behavior. And also we, even when we deprecate functions that you shouldn't be using anymore, we don't remove them because uh, we don't, what we don't want in Clojure is when, when you upgrade a library that suddenly your production system doesn't even build anymore. So, um, mm. so yeah, it's this culture is very much promoted by Rich Hickey himself, who is setting the best example of this with closure. But this culture actually also can be seen outside of closure, like the JVM standard library. I think the Java standard libraries they have a good uh, good uh, track record of not making breaking changes, I think, because yeah, we, we don't just don't like having to change our code when we up, upgrade a library. That's basically the idea. And, um, and the language itself makes it easy to, to, to do this. I would say easier than when you would be in a language like TypeScript or, uh, or Java, because uh changing an interface already kind of isn't breaking change right so breaking changes are all uh are in every corner in in such a language uh while enclosure mm, yeah it's it's easier to 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 not break because we don't have this high coupling uh as you get in a type language i would say mm -hmm. Um, yeah, which touches on the philosophy of um, getting the most mileage out of your data primitives. Um, yeah. uh, you know, really leaning into the maps and lists and vectors um, and avoid using anything else if you don't need it, right? There's that Rich Higgy talk where he goes over the HTML server Java implementation and, you know, it's essentially a map, but everything <laughs> is hardwired into the method names. Um, yeah. And, um, okay, so those are some of the highlights that I could think of. What are some other aspects of Clojure that um, make you particularly excited about it and, you know, dedicate your, your time to it? So I would say the standard library is very uh, well put together. Uh, so Clojure uh, functions communicate via data. Uh, you could compare this with like separate services communicating via JSON, mm -hmm. but instead of like systems on different computers, it's all just w one program. Your functions are communicating in the same way. Uh, that's, that's how you could think about it. And uh, so the standard library makes it very easy to modify or mold this day, so you don't actually modify like the data, uh, as in you ch you change the the data itself, but you you create you transform the data into new data. That, that's what usually is happening in a function, and the standard library makes this very easy and elegant to to do. It's very well put together, very well thought out, and once you know this standard library. Uh, you can you can use it in any closure other closure dialect that uh, mm. so you you learn this language once like on a JVM platform but then you can uh, transfer this knowledge to a different host like JavaScript and use what you learn over there as well so that's what I like about closure the closure is not a large language it's easy to for me at least easy to to understand standard library, I mean, um, is, yeah, it's, it's, uh, all you need for transforming data, uh, or most, most what you need every day. And that, that's what I like about it. It's very, uh, it's a very coherent language. Every, all the concepts in the language 
uh, match very well together. It's not like a, a language made by a committee, but by one person who has strong ideas about how things should be. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so it, it makes me... So the combination of all of these things, the, the standard library, the data-oriented approach, uh, the functional programming approach, and the REPL, that combination really makes me very productive in this language. And uh, it's not for everyone. Uh, by now, we know that. Uh, that's fine. Um, there's enough people who who do uh, resonate with it. And that's what, what the Closure community is. Um, maybe it's just a type of people that is attracted to language like closure that is pragmatic and um, focused at, at making things rather than an ideology. Uh, so, I, I mean, there are strong ideas in closure, but in the end, it's uh, the language is made for making things and, and not for uh, like an academic research project, for example. Um, and also, Richicki himself uh, put together like a closure etiquette, like how should the community behave? What what do we find important? And that might have helped too. Um, I mean, you you cannot force people to comply with such an etiquette, of course. But um, I don't know. And maybe it's also because we are not like a very large community compared to JavaScript or uh, Java. And so it's a very tight community. A lot of people know each other from conferences. And that creates uh, friendships and stuff like that. So maybe that's it. Wow. Sorry. About hey, that. you're back. Ah. I'm back. What happened? My internet crashed. Literally, my wife ah, okay. stopped working. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, I thought yeah, it was um, my internet because sometimes my internet has problems too. But okay. No, I still rec you know you'd think we'd have better internet in San Francisco, but here we are. <laughs> uh, and um, oh, so where were we? I I am. Um, I got um, okay. Uh, what were, were we? Oh yeah. So why is the closure community so friendly and good people? <laughs> <laughs> um, the, and that spirit oozes in the community and the projects and it's awesome to see. Um, okay. So we talked a bit about closure. We talked about, um, you know, how cool it is. Um, let's talk about open source and, you know, committing to open source and um, mm -hmm. opportunities people may be interested in, you know, contributing to or uh, finding themselves completely immersed in, um, you know, the how you stumbled upon Clojure and then became sort of like, uh, you know, now it's your life. Um, how, how did that happen in your case? Yeah. So in my case, uh, so I, I discovered Clojure around early 2010 and it wasn't until 2021 that I went full-time open source so that's like 11 years in it, it didn't happen overnight um, and actually also I started creating projects like significant projects also pretty late uh, like my first major projects were in 2019 that's that's when I was uh, nine years into the language already. I did some small things before that, but that's when it really started taking off. Uh, so I think what helped is uh, in the years before, uh, I was also always searching for like the ideal stack, like, hmm. and in the back of my head, I had is closure like the final answer to what I want to invest in or is there is there more maybe and and everybody was talking about type safety and we don't have that enclosure mm -hmm. so maybe i'm missing out on that and 
So I was all, all, always exploring other stuff as well. And then one year I got heavily into Haskell. All the side projects I did was only Haskell. But eventually I decided that it, it doesn't make me as happy as Clojure. And that's a, an irrational answer. But <laughs> that's just... I get my, it though. That was I get my, it. <laughs> <laughs> that that was my conclusion, and uh, so that's when I uh, a button or, or uh, a switch went off. Like, okay, now I'm really going to invest in this language. Uh, I, I've explored enough other options. This is what I wanted to use to to produce software, and that's when I actually started building like tools for myself to make. Uh, life enclosure better for myself. Um, I was always kind of dreaming about being able to execute bash scripts, but but using Clojure's data structures and the Clojure language with fast startup. That was always in the back of my mind. Like you could do such a thing with Haskell, like you can build scripts and then uh, even make binaries of those that start very fast. We didn't have that enclosure. Um, and another thing that I liked about Haskell was that you, yeah, you, you got this this static analysis that was helping you find bugs before you even executed your yeah. code, right? So uh, I started writing. So actually, both of these these things were in the back of my mind. And then in 2019, I started playing around with GraalVM, which is a Java uh, product, a product by Oracle. It's an alternative Java uh, compiler, uh, which lets you create binaries from, from your Java software, standalone binaries that don't need a JVM anymore. I started trying this for Clojure and made some small tools with it just to play around. And then it struck me that I could actually build a tool that did some static analysis for Clojure to give you warnings before you even executed your code. Um, so I started building SailJ Condo, which is a linter for Clojure and a static analyzer. And that project really uh, took off very uh, soon already. And so I built binaries from that that you could hook up to your editor, uh, mm -hmm. for example, Emacs. And so while you were typing, this binary was was ran all the time outside of your REPL. Because REPL is very nice, but uh, you have a few problems uh, that you can have with a REPL is that you uh, have, you build up state over time, but this state might not be like in sync with what your the code that you're seeing in front of you and a static analyzer will will tell you that something is wrong there um also uh finding like syntactical errors without like having like a stack trace that is not so clear about where this thing is uh, so those things are can be found very quickly with some light static analysis it doesn't have to be a full type system like haskell but just some extra on top of what you're getting in a REPL is very useful. Uh, so that took off. That was my first major project, I would say. And to this day, I'm still developing it. And uh, it's also used by Clojure LSP, which is the LSP server for Clojure um, that, that works in any editor that supports LSP protocol, like Calva, for example. Mm -hmm. So all the static analysis that is used by this LSP tool is coming from Sylvia Condo. Hmm. Um, so that was my first project. And then the other thing was uh, like making scripts uh, for closure that execute as fast as a bash script. Uh, that was also a dream of mine. And when writing this linter, this static analyzer, um, it's not like a large step before you realize you could actually 
What you're doing there in a static analyzer is kind of building a compiler or interpreter, but except the interpreter doesn't do anything, it just builds up information about the code, right? But it's, mm -hmm. it's not a large uh, mental step to think, okay, I could actually write an interpreter that actually executes mm -hmm. this code. And um, because one of the things in Clojure is it runs on the JVM, but before Clojure even can do anything, it, it, it evaluates its own standard library and it, it boots up, let's say. And this booting mm -hmm. takes a few or it takes a second or so. Mm -hmm. And that's not ideal for, for bash scripts that you want to run often. Also, a full JVM takes maybe 100, 200 megabytes of memory, maybe 50, I don't know, uh, actually. But uh, that's maybe also not optimal for like lightweight bash scripting. Mm -hmm. So what I did was I made a closure interpreter, which interprets the closure language inside of a, a binary that is compiled with GraalVM. And that allows you to create scripts uh, for closure that are very fast to start. Uh, so that was my second big project, let's say. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's how it started. And then two years later, I went open source full time because I did have like sufficient amount of GitHub sponsors. Um, and also I made a deal with a company that I could work for them for, for two days and then have like, uh, they were already using a lot of my open source tools. So I can kind of work on those tools as long as, as it's also interesting for, for them, let's say. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of trying to do useful stuff for them while also improving my own tools. Um, mm -hmm. So that, that I didn't want to rely completely on the sponsoring because it's sometimes a little bit volatile, let's say. So uh, a big sponsor mm -hmm. can quit tomorrow, let's say. So I have some diversity this way uh, that I'm not relying on a single, uh, single source of money uh, mm -hmm. to, to survive, <laughs> let's mm -hmm. say. Yeah, um, but but it must be pretty cool for you, man, to have um, you know code that you built for yourself be used at you know companies that have um, very high sensitivity to security and and you know really large scale. I'm thinking of Nubank in particular, um, who you know they tout Clojure as their secret weapon, um, and you know you can't you can't really use Clojure at scale if you're not using some of your tools, which I think is really cool. Um, yeah, it's pretty cool that uh, I've heard that they, uh, so, so the author of Closure LSP, he is working at Nubank actually, and all of their services are using uh, Sales Condo and, and Closure LSP, I've heard. So that is very satisfying, of course, to, yeah. to hear. And it's yeah. a bank. I mean, <laughs> and um, yeah. and the other thing is like with something like uh, Babashka, which is uh, the scripting um, the scripting tool, now, Clojure is in a position where you, I, there's very little left, but you could have an entire stack, multi-platform stack, um, that is extremely buzzword compliant, and <laughs> you, the production code that you need to run is all in Clojure, right? Because, I yeah. mean, some of these code can be shared across runtimes, um, yeah. and so one uh, set of parentheses gets you an incredible <laughs> amount of mileage these days. Um, yeah. and, and, and anybody who's ever written a bash script knows that you have to sort of relearn bash every time you have to write a, a script. Um, and so being, Indeed. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's just like, you can't, I can't ever remember, you know, uh, you know, anything more advanced than just like a straightforward script, you know, you, you need to start looking at the documentation. Um, but if you're used to these higher level programming concepts, you know, think, I don't know, map reduce type of stuff, um, you know, mm -hmm. being able to leverage that in a script all of a sudden gives you superpowers. Um, 
So it's awesome. It's it's just a cool it's a cool project. And so what's next? What what are some of the next things that you're excited to tinker with? Yeah, so I'm currently working on um, uh, an alternative closure script compiler, let's say. Hmm. Um, and the idea there is that um, you can compile closure scripts, but using a, a different semantics. So uh, the project is called Squint. Mm. And the idea is that uh, often you write code that has a lot of JavaScript interop, and mm. you might as well use JavaScript objects directly instead of like this mm. closure script mutable data structures. Uh, so a squint replaces basically uh, when you write like write a map enclosure, that's just a JavaScript object directly. And there is also mm. a standard library. The standard library is a re-implementation of, of closure script, but just using JavaScript objects directly. Um, mm. yeah, so, and the idea is that you can get uh, smaller bundle sizes. And it's also mm. also easier to share your project to NPM because you, yeah. So if you're writing a project in closure script, then and you compile it to JavaScript, it's fine. You can share it on NPM. But if everybody is going to do that, you'll get the closure standard library in each of those libraries, mm. and they're not interoperable uh, either because of mm. uh, how advanced compilation works. So, oh yeah, it's all obfuscated and yeah. Yeah. So so the idea is to to let's say dump down <laughs> closure script a little bit and um, to see if we can get by with this like very minimal uh, subset or this minimal implementation. Uh, and to prove the point, I actually ported uh, an existing closure script project, which was written in normal closure script. Uh, which is uh, a code mirror plugin for Clojure to to provide mm -hmm. like syntax highlighting and and stuff like that for for Clojure in in code mirror. And so this project was written in Clojure script, and I ported it to Squint. And now you can use this project directly from npm uh, without the Clojure script standard library inside of it. Uh, so it's in, it's replaced by Squint, let's say. And so, but the original original project also still works in Clojure script. So it's the same code base uh, with mm. a few read additionals here and there, but most of it just works. Uh, and I, I even ported the, the, the test suite to prove that my, my Squint mm -hmm. implementation works the same way. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's what I'm working on currently. The, uh, that's probably the most active project or the newest project that I'm working on. The newest project how, is always the How most big is, yeah, 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 always. What is the, <laughs> uh, your estimate, um, uh, bundle reduction? Uh, what, what, I, I don't know if I caught no. it. It kind of depends uh, how much you are using from closure script, of course. Mm. But this, I mean, the smallest squint program. Uh, if you if you're like you're creating an object, you call a soch on the object with a key and value. You create a new object, blah blah blah. Uh, a small program in squint. It's just uh, I don't know, two thousand bytes, maybe two kilobytes or whatever. Oh wow. Um, if you if you like uh, process it through ES build and then make it a single file that's maybe two kilobytes, and with closure script you you soon reach like everything is kind of these data structures are building mm -hmm. on top of each other, right? So and um, so it's very hard for ES six bundlers to see what you can leave out or not. Uh, mm. And so I think mini for closure script, you end up with minimally, I don't know, I should do a, a test of this, but I don't know, but 
50 kilobytes or 100 kilobytes, it, you reach that easily. Uh, but the Squint standard library is very small and it's written in ES6. So, so tools like ESBuild understand how you can optimize this. Whereas with Closure Script, it's uh, compiled using Google Closure Compiler. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so tools like if you, so uh, the uh, Google Closure is very advanced. It can can optimize the hell out of, out of your JavaScript uh, more than ES ES Build can. But it's this is only useful for um, for applications and not for libraries, unless you mm -hmm. recompile the library inside of your application, right? So it's always the final output. Uh, as uh, whereas with Squint, you can share the the standard library is shared over all the all the compiled to JavaScript projects because it's just an, mm. an NPM module. That that that's not what what ClojureScript has. Um, so there is this. Uh, so the more you 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 publish projects in Squint to NPM, they all share this, the same standard library, and that's not something you can do with ClojureScript. So um, um, there that's, is that. that's super cool. Yeah, yeah, and it makes total sense. I mean, you're giving the optimizer the entry points it needs to do its job, whereas. Uh, in another case, it's hidden away under a layer of complexity that it can't peek through. So you won't get the the gains um, from selecting what to include and what to exclude. Um, Mr. Bort, dude, this was great. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate this discussion. I, I've been eager to geek out about Clojure for a very long time and uh, to get to do it with you is a real privilege. Thank you for, for signing up. Thanks for inviting me, Christian. All right, sir. Talk to you next time. Okay. Do you have everything?